So in my lab, we work on the normal biodegradable um, materials such as caplectode and, um, poly um, and um, polylactic acid, um, and we render it photocurable. And then we can use it as a resin within our writing um, techniques. And the writing techniques that we use are laser-based writing techniques. They're normally um, based on either scanning a laser or projecting a laser through a, a, photo on, through a photocurable re resin. The photocurable resin sets where the laser hits it, while the, it remains liquid where the, where the laser isn't hitting it. Um, so you can wash it off. If you then translate your um, translation stage, you can make a 3D object. And um, so with our techniques, um, compared to other techniques, we can, we can have a reasonably high resolution, and that's around 5 micrometer um, resolution. Now, does anybody have a pointer? Because that's quite easy to point. But okay. Okay, thank you very much. All right, this one. So it's this one, isn't it? Okay, yeah, indeed, exactly. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we have a few applications. Oh, sorry. We have a few applications for that. Um, we do um, nerve tissue engineering on this, and also we make corneal uh, we do corneal tissue engineering. But the application I really want to talk to you about is um, for bone tissue engineering and to make models for osteoporosis in, in, in principle or for bone diseases. Now, and the clinical rationale is quite clear. Like if you look at osteoporosis, if you look at a normal bone. Um, shown cancer's bone shown over here, then you see that the bone density and the bone struts are much thicker, and the, well, the bone is much stronger in that case. If you look at an osteoporotic bone, then the, the, the strength and the architecture of the bone has ex extremely decreased. And it does occur both in men and women, over 50, but of course it's predominantly occurring in, in postmenopausal women. Um, of course, um, if you look at the numbers, there's some critical numbers over here I've gotten from the International Osteoporotic Foundation. Um, this is the lip data for the patient, but also has a profound economic and, um, and health care cost um, to the whole society. So we really want to get um, on top of this disease, really. Um, now, we have models. And look at the 3D biotech model, the model is over here also. We have models of osteoporotic bone um, in vivo, so we can use primates. Now, um, the bone is very similar to a human bone, but of course, well, the, ethically, it's maybe not so easy to approve these things, uh, well, um, um, to do experiments on primates, but also that there's a very costly kind of exercise, of course. We can also use... Um, <laughs> We can also use um, rats and mice, um, but those are very, and those are very cheap, and you can use lots of them. But of course, those are their bones are not really the same as human bones. So, so the bone structure and the like how it, how it actually models itself is not very, it's not similar. Um, and of course, in the UK, we have the three R's guidance, where we want to replace or reduce or refine clinical um, animals for clinical trials. So. So what our aim was in our study is to optimize the parameters of a scaffold um, and then look if the, if you can um, increase the osteogenesis of the bone cells that grow on them. Um, and well, why would we do this? We can, well, there are 3D printed scaffolds on the, um, on, on the market, like this 3D biotech scaffold. Why would we want to make a better scaffold or another scaffold? And the reason for that is on the next slide, but it's, they're reasonable scaffolds, but as Damien's shown, they're not very reproducible. But also another reason, I'll highlight in the next one, is that actually if you look at the 3D biotech scaffold, the strut size is around 100 micrometers. Now for a cell, this is a 2D surface. This is not a 3D. The, the, the cells on these scaffolds don't grow in a 3D fashion. Um, they are flat and they grow on, on a, a like on a 2D surface. So actually it's a 2D surface, although a convoluted 2D surface. Now to make um, more, well, or to get 3D cell growth, you really need um, the, um, the cells to integrate within the scaffold and the scaffold porosity or the scaffold feature size needs to be of the same size of the cell um, that it grows into. So normally we're talking on the 50 micrometers at least. Now, there are some printing techniques that can address that, but they become extremely slow and extremely expensive. So there's two, 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 two photon polymerization, which can make very, very intricate scaffolds, but only very small and very, very slowly. Um, another technique is, of course, electrospinning, which you can then aim for that porosity. But, of course, electrospinning only makes mats. It don't make really any 3D objects. 
So how can you introduce really um, easily um, this kind of 3D porosity on the cell scale within 3D printed scaffolds? And the way that we came up with is this way, where we first make, and, and well, where we first rely on self-assembly, and that's a very simple, like actually emulsion <laughs> templating, so making, mixing a, a, a water with a bit of polymer and then whisking it up um, to get your microporosity. So that's under the 50 micrometer porosity. While then you build your 3D structure beyond that via additive manufacturing or laser-based additive manufacturing. So, um, so that we can control the scaffold length scale from the cell or subcellular level, like micrometer level, um, up to the centimeter of the organ level. Um, so this allows then also to, for high speed manufacturing of these highly porous structures, um, and also it allows, because we can control the self-assembly technique and the laser writing technique independently, we can make hierarchical structures where we can independently uh, make, um, kind of adjust the, um, the stru structure parameters of each hierarchy, really. And just to highlight what actually we use, we use poly high internal phase emulsions. And this is actually risking up a little amount of, of um, organic solution, that's our pre-polymer solution, which we then mix up with water. So the water droplets kind of get surrounded by a thin film of polymer. Then you cure your pol polymer and you get your water out and that's where you get over here. It's a very poor structure, it just as a bit so you can see like actually the 3D porosity within it, which is not very nicely interconnected. Um, these materials are on the market already, so in little discs you, you probably can, well you can buy them, maybe some of you might already use them as alpha text, alpha text discs for um, 3D cell culture. Now we use slightly different materials for this because we want to control the stiffness of, this, of these scaffolds um, and that is by mixing a brittle component called IBOA and EHA, a flexible component, together. Um, can we control the stiffness? And yes, we can. So that's just to highlight. So, so the Young's model is actually the stiffness of the of the of the scaffold can be controlled by, by either um, the soft, the more EHA you get, you you put in it, the softer the material becomes. Also, the, the higher the porosity, of course, the softer the material becomes. But you can actually control it and um, around well, within within hundred to two hundred times. Um, so from zero point three to sixty three megapascal. Um, ultimate tensile strength shows you a very similar trend. And well, the first question is, of course, can we structure these emulsions um, with the laser? And that was our first experiment, just to highlight. We, we, we had our collaborators in, um, and they came from Durham, and they, we, we were both skeptical, and we did our first experiment. That was, that's, that's what came out. So you made, we made little lines that around 100 micrometers in width, but with a very nice porosity of around well, less, than, well, less than 50 micrometers. And we did that with a scanning um, laser setup. But importantly, actually, the scanning laser setup, this laser pointer is quite low in power, but a normal laser pointer is around two to four milliwatts, um, but about two, and a, two to three times um, the laser power of, um, of a normal laser pointer we could make a scaffold at an appreciable ride speed, so two millimeters per second. Um, and what I always find it very interesting is that you can see these structures, you can actually hold them, but actually there's only 10 to 25% of polymer in these scaffolds, so they're, they're full of air. And we can make them very nicely, and, well, rather reproducibly, as I'll show in the next slide. So, so this is um, one of the scaffolds, it's a four-layer uh, wood pile scaffold, a bit like the um, 3D Biotech, but if you zoom in, so 350 micrometer struts, 700 micrometer, uh, 700 micrometer large pore size, if you keep on zooming into it, you start seeing also the microporosity. Um, and we can make really tens and hundreds of them. And Rob, who's sitting over there, made during his, well, during his PhD around 400 scaffolds. It took around three weeks, but okay. <laughs> um, and we achieved some nice results on it. So, um, um, of course, you need that amount of scaffolds for cell growth. And the cells that we chose for cell growth um, were HS and P cells, which are an MSC like cell, but it's a cell line. Um, just to highlight, we did need to coat these, uh, these, um, yeah, these um, scaffolds with a bit of um, polyacrylic acid um, just to enhance the attachment of the cells to it. Um, but uh, we've gotten some very nice uh, cell growth, as you can see. So you can see the um, this nuclei and together also with the active filaments. You can also see ingrowth. So these cells definitely grow in 3D fashion. 
and just some confocal images to like rotate confocal images to highlight. Um, and just to highlight, so to compare to the three three biotech scaffolds, um, these scaffolds score, score pretty well not only on proliferation but also on differentiation towards um, um, towards osteoblastic activity. This was then confirmed by alkal alkaline phosphatase. Now, although these are reasonably controllable scaffolds, we weren't happy. We also wanted to see if we actually can do even better. So then that's why we, we used these, these materials now to make a microfluidic device. I just wanted to, for a few minutes, just to talk about this. Um, and this is to really control the flow within these scaffolds better than, than within the other scaffolds, as um, Damien said in his, in his um, talk. This is a problem. Okay, so, but we can actually also make a microfluidic of these scaffolds. So this is um, the material, and you see this little hexagonal post around 250 micrometers, I uh, know, of 250 micrometers channels and one millimeter posts. Now, if you look at the, um, the flow within this, and let me just see if I can, yeah, I can. Okay, this should be a video, but okay, so the flow within this, uh, oh, is it? Oh, yeah, it's working. Okay, so you can see the particles in play, but the, the, we've also been able to confirm this with. Um, well, with some CFD modeling, so the flow is really right, um, like really quite steady, and it's a really controlled environment to look at flow within cells. Now, of course, now we have had a little look at cell culture, and these again, the same HSMD cells, and you can see that the cells show make a very nice cell sheet within the channels, and don't really kind of grow within the post. Um, indeed, it's time, so I'm just going to wrap up. Um, we did also a few different flow experiments where we looked at cell growth and, and, and under almost static conditions and intermittent and continuous kind of flow. Um, and the intermittent flow and the continuous flow, you see, it started off with lower cell number because they got flushed off a little bit, but they caught up after day 21. Also, we confirmed that the, um, the al mid alkaline phosphatase that these um, scaffolds and definitely in um, intermittent flow are actually quite osteogenic. So just to conclude, <laughs> okay, so uh, to combine, we combine active manufacturing with like emulsion templating, I go hope that actually um, it shows that we can make new, a new kind of scaffolds which, which would be better than the, the previous ones that, we, that people use. Um, and well, the, the osteoblasts seem to like these, these materials definitely. Um, future work about we want to have a look at osteoporosis and that might also need, need to include some osteoclasts now that is much more difficult to do um, um, but also um, explore these materials of course for different other tissues um, and, and I am thanking all the people who are involved in this um, Rob Hussein Rob is over there but Hussein is not here and also Colin who made the scaffolds um, and I thank all my colleagues at Insignia who have been built since throughout the years. Um, thank you for your attention, and I am more than happy to answer any questions if I have any questions um, that you may have. <laughs>